Hello there everybody, Sam Strains here, welcome back to the railway and welcome back to another review. Up to date, a classic Backman pre-grouping tank engine. <music> So today's tank engine is one of my absolute favourites, it's really quite an early one, it's from the LBSC so you know it's going to have a good livery. Let me show it to you, it is this, it is the Backman E4 in the LBSC Umber livery which I think is my favourite livery of all the E4s Backman produced. Now when I was researching this video I was distressed to find that these are not even listed on Backman's website at the moment which means they're certainly not in Backman's range. That's a real shame I think because from what I remember of these locomotives they're are actually really really good so fingers crossed Batman will bring these back one day in the liveries that we like at the time of filming there are still some in stock with various retailers Kerno, as you can see here has some at an incredibly discounted price £84.99 and the RRP is £129.99 so that's a great discount they're not the LBSC versions though I'm not sure I haven't been able to find any LBSC ones in stock so please Batman, if you're watching this bring them back because they are absolutely incredible maybe bring them out in some other liveries if there are some that haven't been done yet, I don't know. Anyway, we're going to take a look at this today. We'll figure out what it's like. From what I remember, this is one of Backman's better tank engines, particularly where the quality is concerned. So I'm hoping we will really enjoy this one today. Let's get it out and find out what it's like. So this is a 0.62 tank engine, which is quite a popular wheel configuration in 00, isn't it? Backman produced quite a lot. There's the Webb Coal Tank that I looked at not too long ago, put a link up there. There's that Great Western one. Oxford did the N7, Hornby do the N2. Yeah, it's quite a popular wheel configuration, and it's one that I really quite like. It's got a, quite a nice balance, hasn't it, with that little pony truck just underneath the coal bunker. Yeah, really, really nice. And of course, this livery, I think, makes this locomotive. It's a nice looking loco, but I think a good livery can actually make any loco can't it right let me show you the end of the box so the version i have here is 35-075 it's a class e4 number 579 and it is indeed in the lb and scr umber and this has the six pin dcc socket because i don't think there's any functions to activate inside here there's no firebox flicker or any other lights or smoke generators or anything so quite simple locomotives as far as the features are concerned let me show you the back of the box because we have a brief history of the e4 so there it is feel free to pause and read that if you'd like although as always i will give you some history in a little while for now though i'm really desperate to revisit this one i remember this being really heavy really nicely detailed and a pretty decent performer as well well let's see if i've remembered correctly shall we all right here it is okay get a better sense of its size there yeah it's a really nicely proportioned tank engine this one i think they are very very handsome it's a good choice of backman i think to produce this one okay let's have a look at some of the paperwork the exploded diagram i've not looked at this in years Okay, so this looks like it's quite useful actually. So over on the left hand side, you've got all of the hints and tips running in, curves and body shell removal, which is pretty important. You can see by the diagram there. Lubrication, yeah, all of the usual. Let's have a look on the other side. Okay, so there's the mechanism. This is the pretty standard Backman mechanism. I think it's reasonably good quality. I think we do have proper bearings on the wheel set and such, although it may just be a three pole motor in this case, and it certainly doesn't have a, a flywheel or anything like that. So it's reasonably basic, but like I say, from what I remember the mechanism does do the job it, it's a good runner this one or at least it was when it was new <laughs> no i'm only kidding product maintenance and care this looks like it's more of the same doesn't it running in cleaning and maintenance lubrication dcc seems to cover all of the bases doesn't it inside it's just product warranty okay good that means we can get on to the locomotive then all right feels good and heavy i mean for a locomotive of this size the weight is quite impressive or so i think i don't think i've ever weighed this one before so i'll get it on the scales and see how it stacks up with other locos and then i can say for sure whether or not the weight is impressive feels it though okay detail bag so look at this there are some really nice inclusions inside here including the head coat discs which seem to have fittings on the back which will allow you to fit them onto the front of the loco presumably so that's quite good you do have screw link couplings included that's a nice touch i've noticed a few models don't even include those anymore and then you've got other buffer beam fittings as you can see vacuum pipes and other bits and bobs in there so that's really quite nice the head coat discs are a great inclusion i do love when we see those okay are you ready then are you ready let's have a look 
Oh yes, look at that, look at that white cab. <laughs> I love the white cab on the roof. I thought to start with that that might mean these E4s hold a Royal train or something, but I'm more inclined now to think that this is more of a just a, an LBSC livery thing, because of course I've got Terriers that have the white roof as well, and I'm pretty sure little Terriers wouldn't have been hauling Royal trains. Could be wrong though. Anyway, look at this thing. This is absolutely beautiful. The livery is stunning, actually. The livery, not only the livery, but the finish as well, as is so often the case from Backman, is absolutely incredible. And yes, in the hands, this thing really does feel heavy. It clearly has the die-cast running plate, which again is the thick, chunky kind. That must be where most of the weight comes from. I believe the boiler and the tanks and everything are just made of plastic, but it's not a plasticky plastic, is it? At least not visually. It really does have that quality sheen that you get with certain locomotives, which I think looks so much better than others that have a more plasticky finish. I don't really know what the difference is. I don't know how a manufacturer would go about getting this finish as opposed to a plasticky one. Do they apply a varnish or some sort of top coat after the decoration has been done? I really don't know. If you do know, let me know. But yeah, I do know that this thing looks superb. It really, really does. So we'll have a bit of history on the E4s, then we'll get this up close and personal for you, and we'll take a look at some of the more intricate details. So the E4 was introduced to the LB and SCR in 1897 to the design of Robert Billington. At the time, the E4 was considered an extremely powerful locomotive, and they successfully hauled both passenger and freight trains for many, many years to come. The class was heavily based on the previous E3 class of tank engine, which was a similar design from a few years previously, uh, 1891 they were introduced, but those had smaller wheels and a lower boiler pressure, so the E4 was a considerable upgrade, and as a result of the E4's success, 75 were built over just six years, and the entire class survived into Southern Railway ownership in 1923, which was almost 30 years after they were introduced. They were slightly modified and updated to have cylinders of a smaller diameter, but it didn't end there. Amazingly, the class even survived right up until the end of Steam 2, so that's into the BR era and beyond, when of course diesels eventually took over. This is the ultimate testament, I think, to their reliable design. The E4s were sadly withdrawn between 1958 and 1964, but only one of them has been preserved. So there it is then, the beautiful Backman E4 up close and personal for you. And this is a reasonably expensive locomotive. I mean, the RRP for this was £129.95, which means that under normal circumstances at the retailers, you would be paying more than £100 for this locomotive. So it is a reasonably expensive one. However, I do think this is one of those situations where you get exactly what you pay for because this locomotive screams quality in basically every area. So you've got that sort of raw quality of the die cast metal running board which brings a lot of weight to the locomotive. It actually weighs 260 grams, which is more than the Hornby J36, which has a tender included in its weight. It's even more than the Hornby Large Prairie, which is a much larger tank engine. Yeah, the weight is fantastic, but the quality obviously doesn't end there. In fact, it's barely begun at the point of the weight. Look at the livery application. The decoration is absolutely superb. Look how clean and crisp the boiler banding is. The precision here is absolutely incredible. Sometimes I sit and wonder whether I have been too harsh on other locomotives when I criticise the sloppy decoration. I felt bad about the Hornby Class A2-2. I wondered, is the lining just too difficult to get right? Was I unreasonable to criticise them for it? Well, seeing how absolutely precise the lining is on this locomotive shows that, yes, we are right to criticise when extremely expensive locomotives don't get that right. And look at the point where the banding meets the top of the water tanks and stops. Look how clean that joint is. I mean, it just demonstrates, doesn't it, how competent those at the factory were that assembled this. It shows that they were good at their job and that they knew what they were doing. And that is clear across the entire model, not just with the decoration, but with the detail application as well, which we'll get onto shortly. Side of the tanks, again, look at the intricacy of the lining. The design for all of the print work must have been quite complicated. You've got the LBSC lettering, which looks nicely applied. The side of the cab, I mean, look how complicated this locomotive is. Very, very odd shape, the side of the cab, and yet the lining is all 100% perfect, so all of the machinery was obviously calibrated correctly. Same again around the back, look at the back of the coal bunker, exquisite lining. The buffer beams are fully painted up as well with the running numbers on, and even the top of the cab, I mean, that cream, I mean, any paint bleed at all from that cream would be very, very obvious, wouldn't it? And actually, it's not too bad, given that there's rivets there as well. I think the cleanliness of that paintwork is quite impressive. Look at that. It goes from a cream straight to a black. 
man, that would look bad if they got that wrong, wouldn't it? So yeah, the decoration is marvellous. Oh, I better show you the front splasher as well. Again, beautifully lined, and you've also got a builder's plate on there. I'll try and get a close-up on that so that you can see it. Okay, but as I say, the way that the details have been applied is incredibly competent as well. And again, that area screams quality. First of all, look at these giant spikes on the running plate. I believe those are there to hold head code discs up at the right height. They're not just horrific torture devices. But anyway, look how sturdy those are. Now, I've had this locomotive for three or four years, and don't get me wrong, I'm careful with my locomotives, but this one has been handled quite a lot. It's been run an awful lot. The fact that all of the details are still present and perfectly straight is a testament to the quality of this locomotive. Really, really impressed with this. The buffers do not appear to be sprung. I'm not entirely sure whether the real ones would be or not. Possibly this came from an era before the sprung buffers were incorporated onto the real things. It would be very interesting to know whether the southern version of this model or the BR versions have sprung buffers, though do let me know if you know the answer. The smoke box might be a part of the moulding. It doesn't open or anything, I don't think, like other Bankman smoke boxes do. But we do have the separately fitted dart onto there. Underneath the boiler, you can see a representation of the valve gear, which I think is a lovely little touch. It's not painted or anything, but if your eyes do sort of wander down there, you won't just see a flat, empty surface. That's great. The top of the water tanks are very well detailed. You've got separately fitted handrails, water filler caps, and a few other details on there, which are nice and fine. Over on the other side, you've got a very finely moulded Westinghouse pump. Perhaps not quite as nicely painted as the rest of the model, but it is at least a very intricately moulded piece. And to be fair, those painted lines are, you know, infinitesimally small. I mean, there's my finger next to them. Overall, it looks absolutely fine from any sort of distance. On top of the cab, we have a separately fitted metal whistle, which looks absolutely marvellous. Metal work always looks better when it's made of real metal as opposed to plastic, doesn't it? Some of the fittings on top of the boiler are a little bit less impressive. You do have sort of gaps around some of the different components, which is unfortunate, isn't it? But the pieces are at least fitted properly so that the gaps are uniform and so that they don't look like they're accidental. I suppose a locomotive released today, 2021, you'd expect a little bit more finesse than that. But overall, I certainly don't have any complaints on the quality. Let's take a look at the cab. So you've got the flush glazing in the front of the cab there, which looks good. The two windows are part of the same glazing piece, but Backman have disguised this by painting it cream, which is pretty good. So it's not terribly noticeable unless you're really inspecting it. And you've got the gauges on there as well. The gauges are not picked out or anything. They are just blank gauges. But the cab detail, as you can see, is really, really nicely applied. You've got separately fitted parts inside there. That regulator definitely looks separately fitted. And even the look at the paintwork on the water gauges there. I find it quite incredible that they've gone to that level of detail on the water gauge, but not on the pressure gauges and such. That's a bit of a strange one. It is really hard to tell, but I don't think the rear windows are glazed. I could be wrong. <laughs> but if they're not, that could explain why there is no sort of plastic joiner piece going between the two windows. And therefore, the realism of the interior is preserved by that. I would say the interior of this cab and others like it that I've looked at recently are actually better than Backman's more recent attempts at cab detail. The Midland 1P, for example, was not as good as that. You can tell that the outside of the windows have that moulded grille on them, which is a very nice effect, actually. Very, very fine bit of moulding just there. You've got the properly realistic coal guard around the coal load, which does have sort of daylight gaps. It's not just a moulded piece. Really impressed by that. The coal load is, I believe, separately fitted, and I think it might be made of metal as well. It's certainly cold to the touch, and we know that Backman do use metal coal loads. That looks like it's removable, as far as I can tell. I'm not going to try and pry it out, because I don't want to scratch anything, but if you ask me, yeah, that looks like it's removable. And then around the back, you've got some very, very fine separately fitted lamp irons as well as steps and things. This logo does have the NEM couplings fitted, as you can see, although I can't remember whether they had those fitted straight out of the box. Possibly they did, actually, because there wasn't any in the detail bag and the detail bag wasn't open. The wheels, as you can see, the wheels are painted black. Some of the blackening isn't 100% perfect, as you can see. But then again, I have cleaned the wheels on this quite a few times, so I don't know for sure whether that is how the Loco came out of the factory, so I will give it the benefit of the doubt there. Overall then, hopefully you can get a sense of the sheer level of detail on this locomotive. It's an impressive one, isn't it? Really, really impressive. And I think the livery just tips it over the edge for me. Absolutely love this one. So I'm going to take a look at the mechanism. I'm going to jog my own memory, then I will present it to you, and then we'll give this loco a test. So there it is, the absolutely beautiful Backman E4 down onto the track. Man, that livery is just absolutely stunning, isn't it? 
So the mechanism is okay. It's okay. We have seen worse from Backman, but it doesn't quite meet the same high standards that the rest of the model does. We'll start positive though. As you can see, we do have proper wiper pickups on all of the driving wheels. That is it though. We don't have any pickups on the rear pony. That is, I suppose, quite reasonable because look at the way it pivots there. It would be very difficult to get wiper pickups on there at least. The base keeper plate is reasonably easy to get off, and as you can see, it is completely removable. It isn't hardwired, it's connected to the rest of the loco via spring loaded contacts, which makes servicing and cleaning really, really nice and simple to do, so that's great. We do have proper turned metal bearings on each of the driving axles, so that's a really good touch. That's quality, that is not the case with all Backman locomotives. And as you can see, we just have the one driven axle in the center there. The chassis, there it is, it's a very simple chassis, reasonably neat and tidy, I suppose. There's the motor, this is just a three-pole motor, unfortunately, and it doesn't have a flywheel either, which is a pity. You've got these messy suppression capacitors, which have just been bodged onto the body of the motor there. That is quite typical of Backman locomotives. It's just not a very smart design. Couldn't they have incorporated those onto the circuit board? It's just not what you'd expect to see on a quality model. And then there's the decoder socket, that is the six-pin decoder socket, and the good news is there's plenty of space underneath there for any large decoders, any wiring that might be in the way, or possibly even a speaker if you can find one to fit in that space. So it's certainly not all bad. The gauging is okay, it's okay, it's a little bit tight, 0.2 millimeters too tight on the, both the front to back and the back to back, 14.6 millimeters, that's the back to back. Quite typical for Backman, but that is about 0.2 millimeters too tight. So yeah, the, the mechanism's okay. We have seen better. Other brands certainly have better mechanisms. And it's a real shame because if this had a top quality mechanism to go with the top quality bodywork and detailing, this would be really, really special. Well, don't get me wrong, it's still a great loco. It just doesn't tick every single box that it could have done. Anyway, let's test the performance now, shall we? Let's see how we get on with this. I'm going to set it to forwards and we will try a crawl. Now this has been run in. Uh, I should say actually this might not be typical of a new E4 because I've had this for quite a few years and I've serviced it a few times and it's run quite a bit. However, I would still say that this is typical. I mean, it still runs as it did when it was new, is what I'm trying to say. So, on that note, here we go, turning up right now, and we'll have a crawl. And as you can see, the control at that speed is really quite good. It's not super duper smooth. I'll turn it up a little bit. You can see the motion isn't 100% smooth, but I think overall I am nitpicking a little bit there because that is incredible. Let's see if it can keep this up. Yeah, the slow speed is marvellous, isn't it? Let's go a little bit more. It actually starts to cog a little bit at that speed, and it's a little bit inconsistent, as though something isn't quite balanced, perhaps. Let's try it going backwards. I tested this a moment ago, so we'll see if we can make it do what it did a minute ago. Yeah, you can see it's not 100% constant, but to be fair, given that this is a three-pole motor without a flywheel, that's not bad, is it? It's not bad at all. Let's go forwards, and it's quite quiet as well. Uh, at the higher speeds, it does get noisy, but at these lower speeds, it is reasonably quiet. I don't think that was always the case. I think it was rather noisy when it was new, but after a few services and quite a lot of running, it has quietened down in its slightly older age. Yeah. It's not dreadfully smooth. I don't know if there's something not quite balanced. I'm still not 100% sure how to check the quartering. I mean, you can get the axles out and try and do it by eye, but I'd love a, a tool that would allow me to accurately measure it, but I don't have anything like that right now. But yeah, performance is fantastic. That's really good. And the pulling power is quite immense as well. I measured a tractive effort of 0.34 newtons. That's actually the same as Hornby's Lord Nelson class. That is a gigantic 460 tender engine. Unbelievable. It's even more than Hornby's B12, and it's even more than Backman's OH Shunter, which is a slightly more reasonable comparison, I suppose. So the pulling power is amazing. Now, yes, I do have proper LBSC coaches now, but I want to demonstrate that pulling power a little bit. So I've got some larger pull and coaches set up and they do have quite a bit of drag to them actually so they should be a good demonstration of what this loco is capable of so let's go to reverse and let us couple here we go i've taken out the front coupling now because i think it looks better without it but the rear coupling is still there okay take it steady has that worked slightly different couplings on the coaches by the way but it does seem that they've coupled nicely yeah seem to have Right, so the theme of today's running session is going to be LBSC locomotives. 
A little bit of a stutter on the points there. I knew that was going to happen. <laughs> That's something this Loco does do. I have tried adjusting the pickups in the past, but yeah, it doesn't seem to help too much. Anyway, yeah, today's theme is LBSC Locos, which is exciting because there are some beautiful ones. So this is the H1 Atlantic, I believe. Another Backman locomotive, similar sort of quality and detail, actually. Perhaps the E4 is very slightly better in terms of its finish, though. Uh, so there we go. That's got some southern coaches. There we go. Looking nice. And then on the inside line, I have a real wild card. It is the Toys or Models 040 generic tender engine. <laughs> And this one was painted into the LBSC livery by Tom, the owner of the shop, which is absolutely amazing. So I thought, what better loco to run? And we now know also that the real LBSC coaches had a kind of livery that looks a little bit like this. So I have put some of the old Hornby four-wheelers behind that because uh, they kind of do look like LBSC coaches. Just waiting here on Gordon's Hill. See which other LBSC locos you can spot, by the way. There is an odd one out. Here comes the E4 then, let's see if that ever so slight gauging issue is going to cause any problems on the second radius. Didn't seem to, I didn't notice any slowing down there. And like I say, these coaches do have a fair bit of drag in them. Gordon's Hill here, not making much of a slowdown. A little bit is normal. Doesn't seem to be any wheel slip though, so that heavy die cast running plate is obviously doing its job. Yep. I mean, that was that was fair, wasn't it, actually? Very, very slight slowdown, perhaps, but no more than is normal. It was quite impressive. Yeah, I mean, overall, I would say this is an exceptionally good model, isn't it? I really don't mind paying a lot of money for Backman Locos when they are good as this, with the exception of the mechanism. I do think that ought to have been better for what this cost. But besides that, and Backman have, by the way, improved their mechanisms quite a lot over the last couple of years, this is a great value purchase, even approaching the RRP, although bear in mind that RRP was set quite some time ago. The Loco isn't in Batman's range at the moment. I have no doubt if it was to come back, the RRP would be much, much higher, and then that would be a very different kettle of fish. But obviously, I'm not going to start complaining about something that hasn't even happened yet. But Batman, if you do bring this Loco back, and please do, please make sure that it's reasonably priced or upgraded. I don't mind paying a little bit more if it has a, a cordless. Ah, did I say that? I kind of did say that because the cordless motors are better than the three-pole Batman ones. A five-pole motor would be fine as well. I'd love to see a flywheel fitted for even better performance, perhaps extra features such as a firebox glow or, I don't know, maybe a, a pre-fitted speaker for those of us that use sound. Yeah, there's quite a bit that could be done to upgrade this locomotive and make it justify the current price tag or perhaps even a slightly higher one. <laughs> I shouldn't be saying this, it's going to give back my ideas. But yeah, overall, I think the fact is we have seen worst value locos, haven't we? Although I suppose the, the decoration and the quality of the assembly here might have swayed my opinion on that very slightly. Let's have some ratings then for the Backman E4. To be honest, I'm quite impressed. It's been a long time since I've taken a close look at this locomotive, and today I have been really, really impressed with what I've seen. So the level of detail, I think overall I've given it five stars. Maybe that's a little bit generous because some of the cab detailing wasn't fully picked out, and we don't have sprung buffers, but I think both of those emissions are quite reasonable in this case. Overall, the level of detail is superb. If nothing else but for the decoration, the decoration is just stunning. So you've got the amount of lining, but not just that, the precision of the lining as well, which is incredible. You've got lots of metal detailing, including the handrails and the whistle, which looks so much better than a plastic one. And the number of separately fitted parts on this locomotive is absolutely incredible. And even though we have seen better cabs, the cab detail was still really, really good and also ultra realistic from the inside, which is great. Performance, I think, again, was really, really good. We have seen locomotives give a slightly better crawl than this one does. That's why it loses half the mark. It is a little bit coggy at the very slowest speeds, but the loco is very quiet. It's nice and smooth, handles curves absolutely fine. Yeah, overall, I cannot fault the performance too much with this one. And that leads us on to the pulling power, which again is quite phenomenal, 0.34 newtons. That is quite a lot. There are several larger locomotives that don't pull as well as that. So yeah, the pulling power, 22 coaches on straight and level track. That's very good. The mechanism leaves a little bit more to be desired, I would say. There are one or two nice features on the mechanism, the proper turned metal bearings on the driving axles. That's a great little feature, I like that. However, the three-pole motor and the lack of flywheel are two major drawbacks with this locomotive. 
and who knows, if they had have fitted five-pole motors with flywheels into this loco, then maybe that performance would have been bumped up to five-star as well. Yeah, the mechanism leaves a little bit to be desired. I think for £129.95 RRP, that ought to have been a little bit better. That leads us on to quality. Now, the build quality of the locomotive, I cannot fault. Everything was perfect. The decoration was particularly perfect. The detail application, very, very good indeed. The way the models are assembled is superb. No glue in sight, for example. It loses one mark for the motor. These motors are a little bit problematic. I have had issues with these motors in the past. By no means is that true of every single motor of that type. But of all the motors that Backman use, I would say I've had most problems with this particular design. So it does lose a mark for that. But otherwise, the quality is fantastic. I love the die-cast running plate as well. That gives the Loco a lot of weight and therefore pulling power. Value for money then, overall, I don't think this is too bad at all. £129.95 is the RRP. That would make the, the retailer price, what, about 15% down from there. That's not too bad, is it? And particularly if you go to some of the other retailers like Kerno, as I showed you at the start, with their price of £84.99, I think for the BR version, but you know, whatever. Yeah, it's a fair price, isn't it? It's not unreasonable. It's not a bargain either, which is why I haven't given it five stars. But overall, yeah, no problem with the value. So that is a very good score of 8.5. 5, 9 out of 10. Let's put that into the logbook. Oh, I'm surprised. Second place. Oh, I wasn't expecting it to be as high as that. So that is below the 1P and above the Peckett. Yeah, wow. It's better than I thought then. Yeah, it's a great model. Bankman, please do bring it back. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed that one. And do you know what? It holds up, doesn't it? It still looks like a top quality model, excellent level of detail, fantastic decoration. All of this is easily on par with locomotives released over the last couple of years. And in some cases, this is far, far better than some of them. So yeah, I really do love these. I mean, keep an eye out for one. If you really like LBSC or even pre-grouping locomotives, look out for one of these, particularly as they do tend to go for quite a good price these days. Yeah, absolutely fantastic. If you don't mind the slightly shoddy mechanism, which you should obviously be aware of, you can do much, much worse than this. So there we go. Yeah, that was great. I think there was actually value in revisiting this locomotive because it's reminded me just how fantastic these are. So thank you very much for watching. I hope you agree. I hope you enjoyed it. Do let me have your thoughts down in the comments. Was I too generous? Should I have been harsher on the me mechanism of this? Is there anything I missed? Do, of course, let me know. For now, though, thank you very, very much for watching. You enjoy yourselves. I'll see you very soon. You take care. Cheers, everybody. Cheers, everybody.